morning. It's good to be back despite the, the cold and the COVID to see you all here as we jump back into our study of the Psalms. Um, so in the fall, we looked at various Psalms in our, in our study of God's attributes. And our goal then was to know God better so that we could trust him more. And meditating on the Psalms are a wonderful way to do that. Uh, but another reason why the Psalms are invaluable for us is because they have a lot to teach God's people today about how we can live faithfully. And they do this by addressing really every part of our human experience, including hard things like feelings of adversity or affliction or abandonment. In the Psalms, we find King David and the other psalmists expressing hope and joy and longing for God. But we also find them expressing all the same negative human emotions that we all experience. Things like fear and anger and frustration. And so meditating on the Psalms teaches us how we too can cry out to God, whatever the emotions or the situations are that we're experiencing. And reading through and meditating on the Psalms are, are kind of like having conversations with God. Because besides modeling for us how to bring ourselves to him, as, as messy as we are, through the Psalms, God speaks to us about who he is. He's holy, righteous, and just, but he's also our refuge, our shepherd, and our king. And knowing these things helps us understand how we should approach God when we bring our anger, our fears, or our frustrations to him. We need to do this with an understanding of who God is, our all-powerful creator who loves us, who provides for his people, and who has a plan for our lives. If we immerse ourselves in the Psalms, we can learn to do what the psalmists do, which is bring every circumstance of our lives to God and then process those personal situations through the truth about who God is. And if we, if we do this, if we bring the circumstances of our lives to God in prayer, relying on what we know to be true of him, that will profoundly shape how we relate to God because we'll actually be praying our theology. And what I mean by that is that we'll be praying to God what we believe about God and about his great love for us. And praying what we believe can help us. It can help us to seek comfort in God by bringing our sorrows to him. It can help us to find mercy from God by confessing our sins and repenting of them. It can help us, praying what we believe can help us gain new wisdom and perspective from God by meditating on his truth and thinking about how that applies to our lives and always putting God's greatness by our human situation so that we keep things right-sized and in the correct proportion. Praying what we believe can help us to depend on God, asking things of him, but then accepting his will for our lives. And finally, praying what we believe can help us to commit ourselves to God, our creator and our loving father. And I think all of these things will come not so much from us expressing ourselves and our desires to God as much as he wants us to do that, as important as that is to do, but more as we listen to what God is saying to us through the Psalms. And then we learn how to respond with an appropriate humility because of who God is and who we are. Stephanie White mentioned in our last meeting last fall semester that she was reminded that the psalmist bring, which she called, I loved it, our unvarnished selves to God, and that she should be doing that too. And while God does want us to share all of the unvarnished parts of our lives with him, it's also true that as his people, we're called to reflect him by living a certain way for two reasons. One reason is that because, because having postures of gratitude and, and trust and hope and joy, among others, should be our response to our salvation and to how God is changing our hearts and over time changing us and making us more like Jesus. The other reason we should live with these postures is so that we can be a source of comfort and joy to other people who are living in a dark world and point them to God.
As the essay in the beginning of this part of our study guide by Tim and Kathy Keller points out, the Psalms are a wonderful guide for practical, faithful living because pretty much every situation in life is found in them and addressed. And so the Psalms can help us to prepare to face and deal with whatever spiritual, social, or emotional condition we might find ourselves in. So in our study this spring, we're essentially gonna be using the Psalms as a primer on how to live faithfully as we take a deeper look at various postures or attitudes that we should have as God's people as we strive to be faithful to God's law while we live in a broken world with everything that entails as we wait and hope for Jesus to return. So what are some of the specific postures of God's people that we're going to be studying this spring? Well, we'll we will, whoops, sorry. Uh, we'll begin next week by looking at the importance of meditating on truth. How important it is that we intentionally seek out and rely on God's truth in his word about who he is and how we should live as we continue to wrestle with everything that goes with being fallen people who are living in a fallen world. As the essay for next week in the study guide points out, the things that shape our thinking, they shape our lives. So the implication of this is that the more distracted or mesmerized we become by the voices of this world, and just think about all the things in our culture and our media that are constantly telling us this is what's going to lead to personal happiness and fulfillment. So the more either distracted or mesmerized we become by those voices, the less anchored we can become spiritually. And without our even realizing it, we can begin to drift away from God if we become more influenced by the things of this world that are opposed to God. And that's why anchoring ourselves in the truth of God's word and meditating on it is so critical to helping us to live faithfully in a broken world. Next, we'll move on to the importance of praise and worship. And we'll read the last Psalm that's attributed to David, Psalm 145, in which David is praising God for who he is, for everything he's done, and for what he's promised his people. The essay in the study guide for that week is by C.S. Lewis, and he points out that when we really enjoy something, praising it to other people, it actually enhances our own enjoyment of it. So, for example, think about some beautiful vacation spot that you just love, or some restaurant that has food that you, it's your favorite. You've probably talked about those things to other people. You've probably told them why you, why you love those things so much. And in doing that, in telling other people about the things that you enjoyed, that very act of praising them allowed you to enjoy those things again even more. And Lewis is saying that that same thing is true for our enjoyment of God. That our, our delight in God, our enjoyment of God isn't fully complete unless we express it through praise and worship. And Lewis goes on to say, when you understand this, you realize that praising and worshiping God is actually part of enjoying God. It's a way of enjoying him forever. As we continue our study of the postures of God's people, we'll look at the importance of confession. And we'll be studying Psalm 51, the well-known the well-known uh, psalm by David, in which he brings he acknowledges his sin and he brings his broken contrite heart to the lord in this psalm we're going to see that besides confessing his sin david asked to be cleansed of his sin he asked to be given a pure heart a steadfast spirit and to have the joy of his salvation and the spirit of god remain with him so if you think about everything is david is asking for here it's actually a lot more than simply asking to be forgiven but as the author of the essay in the study guide for that week says, David comes before God with an expectation, kind of like in the psalm we, we went over together this morning. David has an expectation that his holy God unwaveringly wants to forgive his people and restore joy to those who love him. 
And David was right to have that attitude because God is full of forgiveness because of who he is, a God of compassion and mercy and love. Our next lesson will be on having a posture of trust. If you think about it, our trust in God is based on our knowledge of who he is. As I said earlier, that's one of the reasons that we study the attributes of God in the fall, because the more we know God, the more we can trust him. And when we face difficult situations, we need to continually remind ourselves that we can trust God to see us through because of who he is. Trusting in God is what makes believers different than other people who tend to either uh, put their trust in themselves or other fallen people or material things. When we place our trust in God, that can be the firm foundation that we can anchor ourselves to no matter what our situation is. Trusting in God is essential to our life as believers. It's, it's an integral part of our faith in God. And as the essay in the study guide for that week notes, trust in God is something that grows in us by his grace and through the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Now, understanding intellectually in our heads that we need to trust God uh, doesn't mean it's going to be an easy thing to do. When we face a situation in which we actually have to trust God when we walk through something that's really hard. I'm pretty sure this is something that many of you that are sitting here this morning and those of you who are listening remotely um, have experienced at some point in their lives. And I'd also be willing to bet that those same women can attest that when they trusted God through a crisis or a fire, that their faith was made stronger. Our next lesson will be on having a heart of gratitude. And we'll look at how our thankfulness fundamentally should be based not on our circumstances, but on our relationship with God himself and everything he's done for us and everything he continues to do in our lives. The author of the essay in our study guide for that week says that gratitude is often referred to as a gateway spiritual discipline. Because when we realize that none of the blessings in our lives were earned, that they were all freely given to us by God because of his love for us, then that reminds us of how dependent we are on God, how much we need him. And when we have grateful hearts because of who God is and everything he's done for us, it allows that posture of being grateful allows more of God's grace to fill our lives. Having grateful hearts doesn't mean that God's always going to give us what we ask for or what we want, but it does mean that we'll feel his presence more in our lives. The next week we'll move on to what's called the fear of the Lord. And I really liked how John Piper explained this concept in his essay for that week in the study guide, making it easier for us to understand the difference between the fear of the Lord and the normal human fears that we all have probably experienced at different times in our lives. Piper says that Jesus died for us on the cross to allow us to know and love God with a proper awe and reverence because of who God is but without a cowering fear because of how broken we are. So that's what the fear of the Lord is. It's a proper reverence and awe, but it's not a cowering fear. And that's a very different thing than the normal human fears that we've all probably experienced, uh, fear about pain or fear over the loss of things we love or fear about not getting things that we want. After that, we'll be studying having a posture of obedience. In Charles Spurgeon's essay in the study guide for that week, he notes that God's grace and Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross were both meant to enable us, God's adopted children, to become more like Christ, who was always obedient to his Father's will in heaven. And Spurgeon goes on to say that faith is the foundation of our obedience and that true heartfelt obedience is cheerfully given. It's not forced by anything outside. And that's why it can survive temptation and even suffering. The heartfelt obedience of a believer is much different than uh, the obedience we often see in this world where obedience is something that's demanded or compelled by those in power and it's only given because the alternative isn't good or there isn't an alternative, um, not because of any heartfelt desire to obey. 
And so we'll see that the desires of our hearts are central to our willing obedience. That, that if God is the desire of our hearts, we'll want to obey what he tells us through his word. The next lesson is on longing for God, and that also deals with the desires of our hearts. And we'll read that week in Psalm 63 how the psalmist is seeking and yearning for God, just like he would seek water in a dry, parched land, because he knows that's the source of life. The essay in the study guide for, for that week addresses the truth of how ultimately nothing in this world will ever really satisfy our souls how we thirst for God with a longing that only God can fulfill because that's the way he designed us. And oftentimes, even though God is now living in our hearts, the reason we don't hear the quiet voice of the Holy Spirit or sense God's presence more in our daily lives is because we're still paying too much attention to the things of this world that are demanding our attention and constantly <clears throat> excuse me, constantly trying to conv convince us that they can fulfill the deepest desires of our souls. And when that happens, we can start to seek and long for the things of this world more than the God who created it and who created and designed us to be in relationship with him. The following week, we'll be looking at lament which is a legitimate posture for God's people when we're experiencing anguish or feeling forsaken. It can be a faithful response to all the brokenness in our world and to the brokenness inside ourselves as well. And this lesson will teach us that it's okay to lament, to cry out to God when we're suffering, when we're feeling pain. As long as we do that with a full understanding of who God is and are humble enough to trust in that. As the study guide notes, David wrote Psalm 22 that we'll look at that week at a time when he felt abandoned by God, when he was probably wondering why God was allowing this situation to unfold that David found himself in. In this Psalm, we'll see David expressing the tension that we all often feel between, on the one hand, our expectant hope for God's kingdom, and on the other hand, the tragic state of our world and sometimes of our own lives. But, and this is the key point, even in the midst of expressing his pain to God, David also acknowledged God's faithfulness, he expressed his trust in God, and his hope that eventually everything would be made all right. And we need to hold on to all those same things, faith and trust and hope when we're lamenting to God, when we're bringing our pain to God. As the essay in the study guide said, if we can do that, just like Job, we might not get answers for why we're suffering, but we will get a deeper relationship with God himself, who understands our suffering because he sent his son to suffer and die for us. When you look at the book of Psalms as a whole, it's clear that all the Psalms can be divided into one of two types, Psalms of lament or Psalms of praise. And while there are a lot of psalms of lament, interwoven throughout the book are psalms of celebration and joy. And it's important to notice that overall, throughout the book of Psalms, there's a shift from lamentation to joy. And so near the end of our study, it's appropriate that we'll then look at joy as a posture of God's people. That week's lesson is based on Psalm 126, and it will address the difference between happiness which is always fleeting because it's based on changeable circumstances, and true, deep, and abiding joy, which is based on understanding who God is and his grace in our lives. That week's study hopefully will help us see that true, abiding joy is based on what God has already done for us and what he's promised for our eternal future with him. In the essay for the study guide that week, Christina is gonna share with us her personal journey as she sought to understand the, the relationship and the intermingling of joy and pain in a life of faithfulness. How she came to understand that pain isn't actually the enemy of joy, but it's simply part of the process of sanctification that, that we all go through as God works in our lives and brings about his purposes for us. <clears throat> 
The essay she wrote is vulnerable and it's rich in wisdom and humility. So Christina, thank you in advance for being willing to share your journey with us all in your essay that week in order to help all of us to a better understanding of joy and to help each of us live with our own sorrows by seeing them through the lens of God's grace in our lives. And then we'll end our study by looking at our Christian posture of hope, which is linked to our joy and which just like joy doesn't depend on our current circumstances. That last week we'll be studying Psalm 84, which is about why we have hope. And we'll see that the psalmist yearns to be fully in God's presence and that God himself is the source of his hope and ours as well. As New Testament believers, we have the great benefit of knowing that God loved us so much that he came down and made this broken world his home so that ultimately we can make God's home our own and spend eternity with him. As Randy Alcorn points out in his essay in our study guide, Jesus has prepared a place for us in our Father's home and we were made for a person and a place. Jesus is that person and heaven is that place. Heaven is the Christian's certain hope, a hope that can and should sustain us through life's darkest hours. But this doesn't happen automatically. We must choose to think about heaven and center our lives around it. So those are the postures of God's people that we're gonna be studying this spring through various Psalms. And I think it's gonna be can be a really rich time together. So I would encourage you all to be here as often as you can, bring your blankets, um, and let's close together now in prayer. So Father, I, I thank you for the book of Psalms where you've revealed to us both who you are and how we should live as God's people, as your people, how we should be people who are grateful and contrite and hopeful and joyful ultimately trusting in you and I thank you for helping us giving us the Psalms as a primer to help us to live faithfully as we strive to wrestle with everything that we confront in this broken world ultimately I thank you for who you are and everything you've done for us so thank you father